from our archives, the Billy Graham Classics. Now I want you to turn with me, if you will, to the ninth chapter of the book of Hebrews. The ninth chapter of the book of Hebrews, and I'll come to the text a little bit later. I want to speak tonight on the subject, three things, three things you cannot do without. Three things you cannot do without. My father was not a poor man. He was not a wealthy man. He would be called middle income. He made whatever you can make on a two or three hundred acre red dirt farm in North Carolina. I never did look at his bank account, never knew how much he made. He seemed to have enough on the table and we always had one suit of clothes a year and we had five cents of ice cream every Saturday night and we did pretty well. Look at the Waltons. You'll see a little bit about how we lived in those days in the mountains of North Carolina. You know, Immanuel Kant once said, a man is rich not by what he owns, but by what he can do without. You're not rich by what you own, but what you can do without. I've always remembered that statement. And as we're entering a recession, I guess we're in one, or a depression, whatever you call this that we're in. You'd be amazed at what you can do without. We may have to go back and live like we lived when I was a boy, and I, but I'll tell you, you could walk down the streets of all the towns around there and you wouldn't be afraid of being hit over the head or mugged. You never heard of a rape I guess they had them. I never heard of them. I don't ever recall hearing about a murder in our community. And somehow or another, we children thought we were the happiest people in the world. And we had to work from three in the morning till sunset. My mother always served breakfast at 5.30 every morning. And we didn't know how bad off we were. Now, the Bible says there are at least three things you can't do without. If you are to have joy and peace and assurance and your sins forgiven and to know that you're going to heaven, what are they? The first one is found in Hebrews 9.22. Without the shedding of blood, there is no forgiveness. Without the shedding of blood, there is no forgiveness. In other words, if Jesus Christ had not gone to the cross and shed his blood for your sins, you could never have forgiveness. You would be a lost soul. Without the shedding of blood, there is no forgiveness. Because from Genesis to Revelation, blood is shed. And why? Leviticus 17, 11, Moses said, For the life of the flesh is in the blood and I've given it to you upon the altar to make an atonement for your souls, for it is the blood that makes atonement for the soul. Now, if you're an average person, you have five quarts of blood circulating in your body every 23 seconds. Blood carries the garbage out without contamination. It's the most mysterious substance in the whole anatomy. Nobody exactly knows all about the blood. And we're all related by blood. You may be a black man, a brown man, a yellow man. Whatever your background, you are related to me by blood. Our blood, can, if it's the same type, can be interchanged within the races. The Scripture says, the Apostle Paul said, God hath made of one blood all the nations of men to dwell on the face of the earth. When I have a blood transfusion, as I've had on several occasions when I've had operations, I didn't ask him, what's the color of the man's skin that blood came out of? I just want to get it in there fast as I can. Our blood, we're related. We're related to Adam. Adam and Eve were the first parents. 
and Adam and Eve sinned against God and they broke God's law. They rebelled against God and then an interesting thing happened. They tried to cover their sins with fig leaves and they couldn't do it. You know what God did? God went out and slew some animals and blood was shed and God was teaching man from the Garden of Eden to this very hour that if you are to have forgiveness of sin, blood has to be shed. And you go all the way down through the Old Testament, it's the same thing. I go in the New Testament, it's the same thing. When Cain and Abel, they were the first sons of Adam and Eve. Cain came along and brought his sacrifice, but there was no blood in it. Abel brought his and there was blood in it. God accepted Abel's and rejected Cain's and Cain got mad and became jealous of his brother and killed him and you had the first murder in the history of the human race according to the Bible. And then you remember that night in Egypt. God said, I'm going to kill as a judgment in Egypt the firstborn of every house in all of Egypt and every Jew remembers that even to this hour and they celebrate it every year. I want you to take some blood, an animal, slay an animal, take the blood and put it on the doorpost and when I see the blood, I'll pass over. Not when I see your good works, not when I see how rich you are, not when I see what church you belong to, but when I see the blood, I'll pass over. Why? You go to the communion. On Sunday, and you take of the wine or the grape juice, whatever your church serves. That wine or that grape juice stands for blood, the blood that was shed on the cross. John the Baptist cried out, Behold the Lamb of God that taketh away the sin of the world. Why did he call him a lamb? Because as a lamb, he was going to the cross. His blood was to be shed for your sins. He takes away the sins of the world. And that blood tonight can cleanse every sin you've ever committed. There's power in the blood. Without the shedding of blood, there's no forgiveness. Do you want forgiveness tonight? Do you want forgiveness of every single sin? Because you see, you cannot get into heaven if you're guilty of a single sin when you get to the entrance of heaven. Every sin has to be forgiven and there's no way for sin to be forgiven except by Jesus Christ's work on the cross. Now blood, of course, is symbolic in the Bible. It means the life of Christ was given for us at the cross. And when he died on that cross and shed that blood, God accepted that sacrifice instead of you having to make a sacrifice. In other words, you won't have to spend a day at the judgment. You won't have to spend one day in hell. You will be forgiven as though you had never sinned by the blood. Without the shedding of blood, there is no forgiveness. The scripture says, For as much as ye know that ye were not redeemed with corruptible things as silver and gold, but with the precious blood of Christ as of a lamb without blemish and without stain. One of the most popular songs a couple years ago was, Oh, happy day when Jesus washed my sins away. And in Revelation 12 we read, They overcame how? By the blood of the lamb. Without the shedding of blood, there is no forgiveness. Jesus paid the ransom. I read the other day about this Italian playboy that was kidnapped and they're holding him right now for ransom for $16 million. And there's a popular song right now also that says, don't pay the ransom. But if Jesus had not been willing to go to that cross and pay the ransom with his own blood, you couldn't be saved you couldn't have forgiveness. And on the cross, God is saying something to all of us. He's saying, I love you, I love you, I love you, I love you. I love you so much that I'm willing to see my only son die. The angels couldn't believe it. They pulled their swords, 72,000 of them ready to come and sweep this whole planet into oblivion and rescue the Son of God. But he never called them. 
He said, I came to do the will of my Father. He died and he shed his blood on that cross for you. And without the shedding of blood, you could not be forgiven. The second thing that you can't do without, Hebrews 11.6. Hebrews 11.6. Just turn a couple pages over. Hebrews 11.6. Without faith, it is impossible to please Him. Now, Christ has already done the work on the cross, but now comes your part. Without faith, you cannot please Him. Hebrews 11 has been called God's Hall of Fame. And after this passage, some of the men and women of faith are listed, like Noah and Abraham and Sarah and Isaac and Jacob and Joseph and Moses and even a prostitute, Rahab, because she too believed in God and proved her faith by her works. Well, you say, what is faith? I've committed all kinds of sins and, and, and I know that I, I have to have the blood and now I find out I have to have faith what is faith? How do I get this faith? Do you know what faith is? I'm not sure I can explain it all to you, but faith is believing and receiving what God has revealed. What God has revealed in this book, what God has revealed in nature, what God has revealed in conscience. And it can be defined as that trust in the God of the Scriptures and in Jesus Christ whom He sent for salvation. Faith is personal trust apart from any works in Jesus Christ. I cannot work my way to heaven. After I receive Christ as Savior, I prove that I'm a Christian by my works. But you cannot do one single thing to earn one minute in heaven. For by grace are you saved through faith in that not of yourselves, it is the gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. But to him that worketh not, but believeth on him that justifieth the ungodly, his faith is counted for righteousness. My salvation does not depend on even 1% of what I do or am. It depends entirely on the work of Jesus Christ at the cross and the fact that I have received him as my Lord and my Savior. But after I'm saved, I am sinning every minute and every day if I'm not working for my Savior and abiding in him. And faith without works is dead, said James. Now, the Bible teaches that faith is the only approach to God. For he that cometh to God must believe that he is. And the Bible tells us that faith is commanded. Jesus said, have faith in God. And that's an imperative there in Matthew uh, or Mark 11. And then on another occasion, John said, and this is his commandment, this was the commandment of Jesus, that we should believe on the name of his Son, Jesus Christ. It's a command. God commands you. He commands you. He gives you an order. Believe. Believe, believe, believe. Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and thou shalt be saved. There's no other way that you can approach God, no other way you can know God, no other way you can come in contact with God except through faith. Therefore, being justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ, Romans 5, 1. What is faith? The reception of the gospel, confidence in God and His Word, being confident of this very thing, a total dependence on Christ for our forgiveness and for the fulfillment in our lives. Did you ever hear the story of John Payton, the great missionary in the New Hebrides? He was translating the scriptures, trying to learn their language. And he couldn't translate the word faith and he worked on it for months and months and months and he couldn't find a word for faith. And one day he saw a man lying on a low reclining chair that supports the weight of the whole body. And John Payton said, what are you doing? And the man said, reclining. Payton jumped up and he said, I've got my word for faith. It's reclining on Jesus. And here's how he translated it. 
For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son that whosoever reclineth his whole weight upon him shall not perish but have everlasting life. He that reclineth his whole weight upon him is not condemned. But he that reclineth not his whole weight upon him is condemned already because he hath not reclined his whole weight upon the name of the only begotten Son of God. Have you reclined your whole weight upon Christ and Christ alone? Or are you counting on a little bit of your own goodness and counting on a little bit of church anity? I can't go down here to a church and get on a pew and recline on the pew and say I'm saved. This pew is saving me. No, it's not. You recline on Christ. Your faith is in Christ the person of the Lord Jesus Christ. That's faith. Faith means that I receive and that I do something about it. I'm asking you tonight to put your whole weight on Jesus Christ. Jesus plus nothing. Just Jesus. And then the third thing that you cannot do without First, without the shedding of blood, there's no forgiveness of sin. Second, without faith, you cannot please him. Thirdly, for without me, you can do nothing. John 15, 5. Without me, you can do nothing. Now, of course, Jesus in this chapter is talking about the vine and the branches, and he's talking about fruit bearing. In other words, without me, you cannot bear any fruit. After you come to Jesus Christ as your Savior, you know what happens? The Holy Spirit comes to live in your heart. Now, the Holy Spirit is the representative of the Lord Jesus. Jesus Christ is at the right hand of God the Father. He went away. He sent the Spirit of God here to this earth. The moment you receive Christ, the moment you put your whole weight on Christ, the Spirit of God comes to live within you, and He lives through you and in you and he lives the Christian life through you. Now, one of the most important chapters in all the Bible is this 15th chapter of John. And those of you that come forward tonight, we're going to give you a gospel of John. And I hope you'll read this chapter right away because it's an important picture of our Lord Jesus Christ and our relationship to him. You see, this is the grapevine that he's talking about. And grapevines were grown all over Palestine in those days. And they needed a lot of attention. They grew fast. And they were drastically pruned every December and January. And they bore two kinds of branches, those grapevines. One was fruit-bearing, and the other bore no fruit at all. So the, not, the, the branches that bore no fruit were drastically pruned back so that they would drain away none of the strength from the root and from the vine itself. Now, the wood of the vine has the curious characteristics that it wasn't good for anything. It was too soft for any purpose, so they would take these false branches, these branches that didn't bear anything, and have a big bonfire with them. And Jesus says his followers are like that. Some of them are lovely, fruit-bearing branches of himself. Others are useless because they bear no fruit. And Christians, professing Christians, whose Christianity consists of just professing without practice, words without deeds. I believe the Bible from cover to cover, and I believe the whole the cover because it says Holy Bible, somebody said. A man told me, he said, I'm a fundamentalist with a big F. And he, he looked as mean as I've ever seen. He meant it too. And he was. But that doesn't necessarily mean that you're right with God. You've got to prove it by bearing fruit. You've got to prove it by bearing fruit. What kind of fruit? The fruit of the Spirit. Love and joy and peace and gentleness and long-suffering, all those fruits of the Spirit, they are to characterize the true believer in Jesus Christ. By their fruits ye shall know them, said Jesus. 
By their fruits ye shall know them. There are many of you here tonight, you look like a Christian. You act like a Christian in many ways, but deep inside there's no abiding in Christ. There's no life, there's no sap. The fruit isn't there. Three ways in which we can be useless branches. One, you can refuse to listen to Christ at all. Second, you can listen and then render him lip service unsupported by deeds. Thirdly, you can accept him as master and make him Lord of your life. Because when you come to Jesus Christ, you not only accept him as Savior, but you accept him as Lord, the Lord Jesus Christ. He must be Lord of your eyes, Lord of your ears, Lord of your tongue, Lord of your hands, Lord of your feet, Lord of your pocketbook, Lord of your bank account, Lord of your family. He's first in every area of your life. Is he in yours? Or are you among the branches that need to be cut off? And he said that he cuts them off, he prunes them back, and they're thrown into the fire. Always remember that the branch that bears no fruit must be destroyed if the rest of the vine is to be preserved. Even among true believers that's true because we have in the Bible a very strange passage that I don't have time at this moment to go into, the sin unto death. I believe that there are Christians, true believers, that many times die before their time. Are you abiding in Christ? Jesus withdrew himself into solitary places to meet God, and we must do the same thing. We must keep contact with him every day. It must be constant and deliberate. Never a day when we do not sense his presence. And without this abiding, you cannot do anything that will be spiritually pleasing to God. Without me, you can't bear supernatural fruit. But with him, I can love that fellow over there that normally I wouldn't love. With him, I can be gentle when normally I might want to hit him in the face. With him in my life, living through me, I can forgive the wrongs that have been done and the things that were said. With him, the life can be lived because you see, nowhere in the New Testament does it tell me, Billy Graham, to live a Christian life. It tells me that the old Billy Graham must die and Christ must live through me and in me. He does the living through me if I'm daily, moment by moment, abiding in him. It's his sap that gives me the strength and the life, the spiritual life that I must have. By their fruits ye shall know them. Without the shedding of blood there is no forgiveness. Without faith I cannot please him. Without me, ye can do nothing. I'm going to ask you tonight to receive Christ into your heart. Let him forgive your sins. I'm going to ask you to recline all your weight. Maybe you've put 90% of your weight, but I'm asking you tonight all your weight on Christ. I'm asking you tonight to make him Lord as well as Savior of your life. You may be a member of the best church in town, but you really need Christ in your heart. You may not be a member of any church, whoever you are and whatever you are. I'm going to ask you to get up out of your seat right now, hundreds of you. Get up and come and stand in front of this platform and say by coming, I want Christ in my heart. I want forgiveness. I want to put my whole weight on him. And after you've all come and stood here, I'm going to say a word to you and have a prayer with you. We're going to give you some literature. Then you can go back and join your friends. If you come with friends and relatives or come in a bus, they'll wait. It won't take but just a moment in this stadium. You come quickly right now. Hundreds of you from everywhere. You may be in the choir. And you've been singing all these nights, but you're not sure that Christ is in your heart. You come. We're going to wait.
as hundreds are responding to Mr. Graham's invitation to make a public commitment to Jesus Christ, you can make that same commitment right where you are. Just pick up the phone and call the number you see on your screen. Special friends are waiting to talk with you and pray with you about this most important decision. As you that are watching by television can see, there are hundreds of people here at the University of New Mexico that are coming to make their commitment to Jesus Christ. You can make your commitment where you are now. You can put your whole weight on him and say, yes, Lord Jesus, come into my life, and he will. God bless you. If you just prayed that prayer with my father, or if you have any questions about a relationship with Jesus Christ, I would just call that number that is on the screen. There'll be someone there to talk with you, pray with you, and answer those questions. And remember, God loves you. If you would like to commit your life to Jesus Christ, please call us right now toll free at 1-877-772-4559. That's 1-877-772-4559 or you can write to us at Billy Graham, 1 Billy Graham Parkway, Department C, Charlotte, North Carolina, 28201. Or you can contact us on the web 24-7 at peacewithgod.tv. We'll get the same helps to you that we give to everyone who responds at the invitation. On behalf of Franklin Graham and the Billy Graham Evangelistic Association, thank you for watching and thank you for your prayers. From our archives, the Billy Graham Classics. Now tonight, I want to speak on John's Gospel, the 11th chapter, the 25th verse. And Jesus is speaking to Martha. Lazarus has died, and Lazarus is in the tomb, and Jesus is trying to comfort Mary and Martha, the sisters of Lazarus. And here's what he says. Jesus said unto her, I am the resurrection and the life. He that believeth in me, though he were dead, yet shall he live. And whosoever liveth and believeth in me shall never die. Believest thou this? And she saith unto him, Yea, Lord, I believe. I believe that thou art the Christ, the Son of God, which should come into the world. You know, the Bible talks about three parts of us. The Bible says that we are built with three things. First, we have a body. Now, your body allows you to see people, to walk, to hear, to shake a hand, but the body can never make a friend. It is the soul and the personality that has the capacity to love a person and to have social relationships. And most of us don't like to go to funerals. We don't like to talk about death. And we in America have a great fear of death. And the Bible says in Hebrews, the second chapter, who through the fear of death were all their lifetime in bondage. The fear of death can hold you in bondage all your life, says the Bible. In Genesis 3:19, the Bible says, for dust thou art and unto dust thou shalt return. And in Genesis 5, it mentions this. It says this, and he died. 11 times. You're going to die. Are you prepared to die? The scripture says, prepare to die. Prepare to meet God. It is appointed unto man once to die, and after that, the judgment. But Satan whispered to Adam and Eve and said, thou shalt not surely die. And he still uses the lie on you. You say somebody else is going to be killed in that automobile crash. It's going to be somebody else that's going to get pneumonia and die. It's going to be somebody else that gets cancer. It's somebody else that's going to have a heart attack. But one of these days, it'll be you. We look at our screens and we see motion pictures like Gable and Lombard or pictures on Marilyn Monroe. 
and we think that they're alive or we even see former president kennedy come back on the screen or martin luther king come back on the screen and somehow we get it in our minds that that they're alive right now just like that in the same old body but they're not they're dead so the body dies everybody's body is going to die your body will go to the grave the second part of us is called the soul. Sometimes we interchange it, soul and spirit. But I believe there's a difference between the soul and the spirit. But the soul, what is the soul? The soul can think, the soul can decide, the soul can desire. The soul can know, it can love, it can hate, it can react. To sum it up, the soul is that part of us that we call personality. Now, I have two dogs at home, German Shepherds, highly trained dogs, I might add. One of them's trained to run when you come, and the other one's trained to growl or bite if necessary. But you know, I've noticed that those dogs, they have emotions, they grieve, they, wor they seem to worry if they're not fed in time and they get angry and they love and they each have their own personality because you see a dog has a soul just like you did the whole animal world has a soul if animal has body and personality similar to humans then what makes humans different have you ever thought of that what makes you different than your dog what makes you superior to an elephant what makes you superior to any other animal? The third thing, the body, the soul, the animals have bodies, the animals have souls, but no animal has a spirit. The spirit is something that only humans have. Man possesses something in addition to his body and his soul that the animal does not have. He has the spirit, and the spirit is totally unique. The ability, you know what the spirit is? The spirit is the ability to know and to enjoy and to have fellowship with Almighty God. The God of the universe, the God that made the stars and the moon and the sun and the whole world. You, just little old you, can have fellowship with that mighty God because God gave you a spirit. You are a spirit. Your spirit lives in your body. You're born with that spirit, that ability to have fellowship with God. And the spirit makes even the lowest person in the whole world superior to the highest animal. Thus, the human race operates on three levels, physically with the body, socially with the soul, spiritually with the spirit. Now the question is, what has happened to our spirits? The Bible says that our spirits are dead in sin and trespasses. We've rebelled against God and our spirits have been cut off from God and our spirits are dead. And the reason Jesus Christ came and died on the cross was to reconcile us to God. Sin has separated my spirit from God. I cannot fellowship with God. I cannot know God. I might study all my life theology and never find God. I might study philosophy all my life and never find God. I may be the most brilliant scientist in the world and never find God. Because something has become between my spirit and God and that something is sin and the Bible says all have sinned and come short of the glory of God you are a sinner I am a sinner separated from God this is a planet in which all human beings are born separated from God you can be physically alive soulishly alive but spiritually dead. The Bible says, she that liveth in pleasure is dead while she lives. There's a country western song 
this year that has an older cowboy singing to a younger one that's what needed is faster horses, younger women, older whiskey, and more money. And that's what the world is, alive but dead. Faster horses, alive but dead. Very much like the man Jesus told about who was a rich man. And he said, soul, take thine ease, drink and be merry. You've got many years. Build bigger barns. And God called him a fool and God killed him that night. And God said, thou fool. Many of you think that you have years and years and years and years. And you don't know that at this very moment, there is a point of the day that you are to meet God. And it may be this week. We never know. In this passage that I read, Lazarus, a person that Jesus loved very much and one of his closest friends, had died. And I watched the other night on television a replay of that magnificent picture of George Stevens, the greatest story ever told. And I thought one of the most dramatic scenes in the whole motion picture is when Lazarus is raised from the dead. And I thought of Lazarus as he was in that tomb. He'd been there for several days. And there are several things about him as I looked and thought about it. Lazarus didn't have any appetite. When he was alive, he got hungry regularly, but while he's dead, he doesn't have any appetite. And did you know if you're spiritually dead, your spirit is dead? You don't have any appetite for God. You don't have any appetite to read the scriptures and to have prayer and to talk about spiritual things. You're spiritually dead. You can go to church. Thousands of people today belong to the church that are spiritually dead. They don't really have any appetite for God, for fellowship with God. And the second thing about Lazarus I thought about was he, there was no activity. A spiritually dead person has no spiritual activity. They have much physical activity and social activity, but little activity on behalf of the kingdom of God. A few months ago, my wife and I went down to Guatemala with Luis Palau, who is here tonight. Right after the earthquake, and we saw devastation on a scale we have never seen anywhere in the world, and our hearts ached for those people. And I said, by the grace of God, we're going to do all we can for the hungry and the needy and the hurting people of the world, whether they're at home or whether they're abroad. Activity for the kingdom of God. And then another thing about Lazarus, there was no awareness. He was not aware of his friends. Dead men don't love. Dead men don't see danger. Dead men are, are unmoved by hunger. Dead men don't weep. And then the fourth thing, he was blind. And the Bible says that we too are blind. We have spiritual blindness. Your spirit can be blind. The Bible says the God of this world hath blinded the minds of them that believe not. You are spiritually blind. And then the fifth thing about him was he smelled. He'd been dead for four days, and they said he already stinks. But you know what the Bible says? The Bible says all of our righteousness and our goodness that we try to pile up to please God smells in the sight of God. It's like filthy rags, the Scripture says in Isaiah 64, the sixth chapter. We're saved by grace through faith that not of ourselves. It's the gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. And then the sixth thing about Lazarus was he was bound. You know, the Oriental's method of embalming was one of the most effective the world has ever known. It consisted of endless wrappings. And yet you are alive tonight physically. You're alive as far as your social activity is concerned, but you are bound and spiritually dead. You're bound by habits and sin. Johnny Cash talked a moment ago about drugs and alcohol. And men are bound by the chain of habit, the lust and sin 
of drugs, the lust for money, the lust of the flesh, the pride of life, sex sin. All of that indicates spiritual deadness. Soulishly, you're alive. Physically, you're alive. But your spirit is dead toward God. Would you like to be made alive tonight? Totally, completely fulfilled? Totally alive? Spiritually? What can you do? Well, let's think, what could we do for Lazarus now? He's dead. Let's give him some food. They say, well, what we need to do is feed everybody. Jesus didn't feed everybody when he came. Do you know that? There are thousands of millions of hungry people in the world. We have compassion. We're to do what we can. But that does not bring about reconciliation with God. They have a deeper hunger, a deeper need to be met. And that's the need of reconciliation with God. You say, we'll give people better housing. That's all good. We ought to give people better housing, and I'm for everything that can give better housing to people in this country and people all over the world. But that doesn't bring back the spirit. The spirit is dead. Man has a deeper need. Man's greatest need is reconciliation with God, and that's what Christ came to do on the cross. You say, well, maybe they need more entertainment. Change their environment. You know, many intellectuals today, I notice, are growing uh, disillusioned with the whole human race. They're disillusioned because they fail to understand that the problem of the human race is a spiritual problem. The problem of the human race is not a soulish problem. The problem of the human race is not a physical problem. The problem of the human race is a spiritual problem. Man's spirit is separated from God. He hates, he lies, he cheats, he fights, he kills, he has war because his spirit is not right with God. So man needs to get his spirit straightened out with God. There's one great thing that a dead man needs. You know what it is? He needs life. And Jesus himself claims to be the life that spiritually dead men need. He said that the reason he came into the world was that he might give life more abundantly. He said, here's one of the greatest passages in all of literature. He said, I am the resurrection and the life. Now, if you were a dead person lying in a grave, wouldn't you like to hear that? I am the resurrection and the life. He that believeth in me Though he were dead, yet shall he live. You believe in Jesus Christ. That means to commit to surrender your life to him, to receive him as your Lord and your Savior. And you can have spiritual life. In addition, the Bible says your body is someday going to be raised from the dead. You say, how can that be? I don't know how it can be. I only know that science says that no chemical is lost in the, in the world today, and the God that made it in the beginning can bring it together again. But your spirit will be joined to your body again in the future world if you know Jesus Christ. I am the resurrection and the life. He that believeth in me, though he were dead, yet shall he live. And whosoever liveth and believeth in me shall never, never, never die. Your spirit can be made alive and have fellowship with the God of the universe by believing in Jesus Christ. Now, that is essentially and basically what the gospel is all about, and that's why it's called good news to the world. That's what the word gospel means, good news. And it's good news to millions and billions of people who are dead toward God to say that there is a person that can give you spiritual life and change you and make you a new person. You don't get eternal life when you die. You get eternal life the moment you receive Christ. You can have fellowship with God through Bible reading, through prayer, through fellowship with other Christians. You have fellowship with God. Your spirit is alive. Your body may get tired. Your body may get hungry. Your body may be in prison. Your body may be destroyed by the scars of sin that have already taken place. 
but God will forgive the sin that came between you and God. He will help you and restore you in a thousand ways, but you've got to be willing to go all the way. You know why some people really never find God? They're not willing to go all the way. They want to go part way, third of the way, half way, three quarters of the way, 90% of the way, 99% of the way. But Jesus won't accept you. He says it's all the way. That's the reason he said in that chapter we read last night, he said, I will not commit myself to you. You believe in me, but I don't believe in you. I know what's in your heart. I know what you're holding back. You've got to be willing to surrender all if you are to have eternal life. Then he turned and he asked Mary and Martha, he said, Believest thou this? And Martha answered and said, Yes, Lord, I believe that you are the Christ, the Son of the living God that should come into the world. And you know, Jesus did an interesting thing. He wept. And the shortest verse in the Bible is Jesus wept. Only three times did Jesus weep. He wept at the grave of Lazarus. He wept at Gethsemane the night before Calvary. And he wept over the city of Jerusalem when he saw that Jerusalem was rejecting him as the Savior. And he weeps tonight, I believe, over the great cities of America as he sees the great majority of the people ignoring him, going on in their spiritual deadness, like dancing on the Titanic before it hit the iceberg. And he weeps. There are millions tonight in the tomb of sin. There are thousands here tonight in the tomb of sin. You need to be awakened. Many of you are in the grip of an evil habit, too strong to break, worse than a living death. What was Jesus' answer? He went to the tomb and he said, Lazarus, come forth. You know why I believe Jesus wept? I don't believe Jesus wanted to call Lazarus back. Lazarus was already in heaven. I don't believe Lazarus wanted to come back. You get a person that has died and gone to heaven just for one minute and they see the glory of heaven. Why, you couldn't pay them enough money in all the world to get them to come back. You and I weep for them. They're not weeping. They're happy. Their spirits are happy in total fellowship with God and their friends and the reunion and the happiness that's taking place there. Jesus wept, I believe, because he didn't want to have to call Lazarus back. But in order for his credentials as the Messiah to be established, he was going to raise the dead. So he said, Lazarus, come forth. If he hadn't said the name Lazarus when he said, come forth, every person that had ever died in the history of the world would have come out of the grave. So he said, Lazarus, come forth. And Lazarus came forth. But Lazarus was still tied in the old clothes. Jesus said, loose him. Now, you and I have to be loosed. After we come to Christ, we have to be loosed from our sins, the things that bound us. We have to be set free. And there's many a person that says to me, Billy, I would like to come to Christ, but I don't think I could hold out. You're right. You can't hold out. But he'll hold you. And Johnny was telling us a moment ago about that verse in 1 Corinthians that he came across, and what a marvelous verse. There hath no temptation taken you, but such as is common to man. But God will not allow you to be tempted above that which you're able to bear, but will with the temptation make a way to escape. And even I forgot it, Johnny, because the, there's a phrase there that says God is faithful. God is faithful who will not allow you to be tempted. In other words, God makes a provision for your Christian life. 
He gives you the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit comes to live inside and gives you supernatural power to live a supernatural life. And your spirit is made alive and you have fellowship with God. I'm asking you tonight, will you receive Christ? Are you willing to go all the way with him and commit everything to him? Your mind, your heart, your body, your friends, your family. And you would like to say tonight, I want my sins forgiven. I want to know I'm going to heaven. I want eternal life. I want Jesus to come into my heart tonight. I'm going to ask you to do something that we cannot do tonight. Every night, this stadium has been almost filled, not quite like it is tonight. And we put people on the floor tonight, and when we put you on the floor, we knew that we could not call people forward as we normally do. So I'm going to ask all of you that want to receive Christ, I want you to stand up where you are. We're not going to ask you to come forward. Just stand up where you are and stand there quietly and prayerfully and with bowed heads. And I'm going to ask every head bowed and every eye closed and everybody in an attitude of prayer. And tonight you want Christ in your heart. You want eternal life. Just stand up and keep standing all over the place. Hundreds of you. Just stand up right now. And everyone in prayer. If you would like to commit your life to Jesus Christ, please call us right now toll free at 1-877-772-4559. That's 1-877-772-4559. you that are watching by television, you can make your commitment to Jesus Christ right where you are with these hundreds and perhaps thousands here that are making their commitment to Christ right now. You can say yes to Jesus Christ wherever you are. God help you to make that commitment right now. If you just prayed that prayer with my father, or if you have any questions about a relationship with Jesus Christ, I would just call that number that is on the screen. There'll be someone there to talk with you, pray with you, and answer those questions. And remember, God loves you. If you would like to commit your life to Jesus Christ, please call us right now toll-free at one 877